with the digression on bows, catapults, and kangaroos. An unwise man doth not well consider this, and a fool doth not understand it. Psalm 92 As we said in the last chapter, it was the considerable achievement of the 19th century mathematicians to find ways of calculating the distribution and the magnitude of the stresses in most kinds of structures in a rather broad, generalized or academic way. However, many practical engineers had not long come to terms with calculations of this kind before Inglis planted the seeds of doubt at the back of their minds. Using the elastic Ian's own algebraical methods, he pointed out that the existence of even a tiny unexpected defect or irregularity in an apparently safe structure would be able to cause an increase of local stress which might be greater than the accepted breaking stress of the material and so might be expected to cause the structure to break prematurely. In fact, using Inglis's formula, P67, it is easy to calculate that, if you were to scratch a girder of the fourth railway bridge, moderately hard, with an ordinary sharp pin, the resulting stress concentration should be sufficient to cause the bridge to break and fall into the sea. Not only do bridges seldom fall down when they are scratched with pins, but all practical structures such as machinery and ships and aeroplanes are infested with stress concentrations caused by holes and cracks and notches which, in real life, are only rarely dangerous. In fact they generally do no harm at all. Every now and then, however, the structure does break, in which case there may be a very serious accident. When the implications of Inglis's sums began to dawn upon engineers some 50 or 60 years ago, they were apt to dismiss the whole problem by invoking the ductility of the metals which they were accustomed to use. Most ductile metals have a stress-strain curve which is shaped something like figure 9. And it was commonly said that the overstressed metal at the tip of a crack simply flowed in a plastic sort of way and so relieved itself of any serious excess of stress. Thus, in effect, the sharp tip of the crack could be considered as rounded off so that the stress concentration was reduced and safety was restored. Like many official explanations, this one has the merit of being at least partly true, though in reality it is very far from being the whole story. In many cases the stress concentration is by no means fully relieved by the ductility of the metal, and the local stress does, in fact, quite often remain much higher than the commonly accepted breaking stress of the material as determined from small specimens in the laboratory and incorporated in printed tables and reference books. For many years, however, embarrassing speculations which were likely to undermine people's faith in the established methods of calculating the strength of structures were not encouraged. When I was a student Inglis's name was hardly ever mentioned and these doubts and difficulties were not. Safety regulations which are imposed by governments and insurance companies today. However, even in the best engineering circles, scandals occurred from time to time. In 1928, for instance, the White Star Liner Majestic of 56,551 tons, which was then the largest and finest ship in the world, had an additional passenger lift installed. In the process rectangular holes, with sharp corners, were cut through several of the ship's strength decks. Somewhere between New York and Southampton, when the ship was carrying nearly 3,000 people, a crack started from one of these lift openings, ran to the rail, and proceeded down the side of the ship for many feet before it was stopped. Fortuitously, by running into a porthole, the liner reached Southampton safely and neither the passengers nor the press were told. By an extraordinary coincidence, very much the same thing happened to the second largest ship in the world, the American transatlantic liner Leviathan, at about the same time. Again the ship got safely into port and publicity was avoided. If the cracks had run a little further, so that these ships had actually broken in two at sea, the loss of life might have been severe. Really spectacular accidents of this kind to large structures such as ships and bridges and oil rigs became common only during and after the last war, and latterly they have been growing more, and not less, frequent.
what has emerged rather painfully over a number of years, at a vast cost in life and property, is that Although the traditional view of elasticity as hammered out by Hook and Young and Navier and by scores of 19th century mathematicians is extremely useful and certainly ought not to be neglected or spurned. Yet it is not really enough, by itself, to predict the failure of structures, especially large ones with sufficient certainty. I saw the different things you did, but always you yourself you hid. I felt you push, I heard you call. I could not see yourself at all. R. L. Stevenson, A Child Asterisk S. Garden of Verses Until fairly recently elasticity was studied and taught in terms of stresses and strains and strength and stiffness, that is to say, essentially in terms of forces and distances. This is the way in which we have been considering it so far, and indeed I suppose that most of us find it easiest to think about the subject in this manner. However, the more one sees of nature and technology, the more one comes to look at things in terms of energy. Such a way of thinking can be very revealing, and it is the basis of the modern approaches to the strength of materials and the behavior of structures, that is, to the rather fashionable science of fracture mechanics. This way of looking at things tells us a great deal, not only about why engineering structures break, but also about all sorts of other goings on, in history and in biology, for instance. It is a pity, therefore, that the whole idea of energy has been confused in many people's minds by the way in which the word is often used colloquially. Like stress and strain energy is used to refer to a condition in human beings, in this case one which might be described as an officious tendency to rush about doing things and pestering other people. This use of the word has really only a tenuous connection with the precise, objective, physical quantity with which we are now concerned. The scientific kind of energy with which we are dealing is officially defined as capacity for doing work and it has the dimensions of force multiplied by distance. So, if you raise a weight of 10 pounds through a height of 5 feet, you will have to do 50 foot-pounds of work as a result of which 50 foot-pounds of additional energy will be stored in the weight as what is called potential energy. This potential energy is locked up, for the time being, in the system, but it can be released at will by allowing the weight to descend again. In doing so the released energy could be employed in performing 50 foot-pounds worth of useful tasks, such as driving the mechanism of a clock or breaking the ice on a pond. Energy can exist in a great variety of different forms, as potential energy, as heat energy, as chemical energy, as electrical energy and so on. In our material world, every single happening or event of whatever kind involves a conversion of energy from one into another of its many forms. In a physical sense that is what happenings or events are about. Such transformations of energy take place only according to certain closely defined rules, the chief of which is that you can't get something for nothing. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed, and so the total amount of energy which is present before and after any physical transaction will not be changed. This principle is called the conservation of energy. Thus energy may be regarded as the universal currency of the sciences, and we can often follow it through its various transformations by means of a sort of accounting procedure which can be highly mutually convertible, but nowadays there is a good case for using the SI unit of energy, which is the joule, that is the work done when one newton acts through one meter asterisk. Although we can measure it in quite precise ways, many people find energy a more difficult idea to grasp than, say, force or distance. Like the wind in Stevenson's verse we can only apprehend it through its effects. Possibly for this reason the concept of energy came rather late into the scientific world, being introduced in its modern form by Thomas Young in 1807. The conservation of energy was not universally accepted until quite late in the 19th century. And it is really only since Einstein and the atom bomb that the enormous importance of energy as a unifying concept and as an underlying reality has been sufficiently appreciated. There are, of course, a great many ways, chemical, electrical, thermal and so on, 
of storing energy until it is wanted. If we are going to use a mechanical means then we could use the method we have just been talking about, that is to say, the potential energy of a raised weight. However, this is rather a crude way of storing energy and, in practice, strain energy, the energy of a spring, is generally more useful and it has much more widespread applications in biology and engineering. It is obvious that energy can be stored in a wound-up spring, but, as Hook pointed out, official springs are only a special case of the behavior of any solid when it is loaded. Thus every elastic material which is under stress contains strain energy, and it does not make much difference whether the stress is tensile or compressive. If Hooke's law is obeyed, the stress in a material starts at zero and builds up to a maximum when the material is fully stretched. The strain energy per unit volume in the material will be the shaded area under the stress strain diagram, figure 1, which is figure 1. Strain energy equals area under stress strain curve equals. We are all of us familiar with strain energy in the springs of our car. In a vehicle with no springs there must be violent interchanges of potential and kinetic energy, energy of motion, every time a wheel passes over a bump. These energy changes are bad for the passengers and bad for the vehicle. Long ago some genius invented the spring, which is simply an energy reservoir which enables changes of potential energy to be stored temporarily as strain energy so as to smooth the ride and prevent the vehicle and its occupants from being racketed to bits. Latterly engineers have spent a great deal of time and effort on the improvement of car suspensions, and no doubt they have been very clever about it. However, cars and lorries run on roads whose main purpose is, after all, to provide a smooth surface. The suspension of the car has only to even out the minor or residual bumps. The problem of designing a suspension for a car which had to be driven really fast across rough country would be a very difficult one. In order to store enough energy to cope with such a situation the steel springs would have to be very large and heavy and would in themselves constitute so much unsprung weight that the whole project might prove to be impracticable. Consider now the situation of a skier. In spite of the snow covering, most ski runs are vastly more bumpy than any normal road. Even if a typical run could be covered with some effective non-skid surface, such as sand, so as to enable a car to go on it without slipping, any attempt to drive the car down the run at the speed of a fast skier, say 50 mph, would be suicidal, because the suspension would be completely inadequate to absorb the shocks. But, of course, this is exactly what the body of a skier has to do. In fact, much of this energy seems to be absorbed by the tendons in our legs, which, taken together probably weigh less than a pound. Asterisk thus, if we are to ski fast without disaster or to perform other athletic feats, our tendons have to be able to store reliably and to give up again very large amounts of energy. This is partly what they are for. Some approximate figures for the strain energy storage capabilities of various materials are given in Table 3. The relative efficiencies of natural materials and of metals may come as a surprise to engineers, and some light is thrown on the performance of skiers and other animals by the figures for tendon and steel. It will be seen that the strain energy storage per unit weight is about 20 times higher for tendon than it is for modern spring steels. Although, considered as devices for storing strain energy, skiers are more efficient than most machines, Yet even a trained athlete cannot compete with a deer upon a hillside or a squirrel or a monkey in a tree. It might be interesting to know the percentage of the body weight given up to tendon in these animals, as compared with people. Animals like kangaroos progress by bounding. At each landing, energy has to be stored in the creature's tendons, and I have been told by an Australian correspondent that the strain energy characteristics of kangaroo tendon are exceptionally good but unfortunately I cannot quote any accurate figures. It occurs to me, however, that, if anyone should wish to revive the pogo stick in a more efficient form, there would be a good deal to be said for making the spring from kangaroo tendon, or indeed from any form of tendon. Light aircraft, 
which have to be designed for bad landings on rough ground, often have their undercarriages sprung by means of rubber cords which have a strain energy capacity much better than that of steel springs, and are also better than tendon. Material Working strain Working stress Strain energy stored Density Energy stored Percent P.S.I.MN slash M2 Joules Times 106 Per cubic meter Kilograms per cubic meter Joules per kilogram Ancient iron 00310,000700,017,8013 Modern spring steel 03100,000700,017,8013 Bronze 0360,000,004,068,700,000 you would 0918,000,12056,000,900 Tendon 8010,000,070281,1002,500 Horn 4013,000,0009018,1,2001,500 Rubber 3001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2001,0007100,1,2
Such bows had a core of wood which, being near the middle of the thickness of the bow, was only lightly stressed. To this core was glued a tension surface made from dry tendon and a compression face made from horn. Both these materials are even better at storing energy than you. Furthermore they retain their mechanical properties better than you in hot weather. After all, an animal normally operates at about 37 degrees Celsius. In practice, tendon does not deteriorate appreciably below about 55 degrees Celsius. As against this, dry tendon slackens and behaves badly in damp weather. Composite bows of this kind were used both in Turkey and elsewhere down to comparatively recent times. Lord Aberdeen, 1784 to 1860, traveling to the Congress of Vienna in 1813, wrote of the use of Tartar troops, armed with what seemed to have been composite bows, against the armies of Napoleon which were retreating through Eastern Europe. There is a good deal of evidence that composite bows were better in many respects than the English longbow. However, whereas the bow of Odysseus, as we However, whereas the longbow was essentially a cheap and simple weapon to manufacture, ma manufacture, the composite bow was a much more sophisticated affair and presumably expensive Greek bows were composite bows. And the boy of Odysseus, like that of Philosites, seems to have been a pretty special job. Okay. As we all know, this turned out to be beyond the strength of any of them, even the technically minded Yuri Machus, and now Yuri Machus was handling the bow, warming it on this side and on that before the heat of the fire. Yet even so he could not string it, and in his great heart he groaned mightily. But after all, why bother? Why didn't the suitors, or Odysseus, or anybody else, just use a longer string? The answer to this is for a very good scientific reason, which is as follows. The energy which a man can put into a bow is limited by the characteristics of the human body. In practice, one can draw an arrow back about 0 to 6 meters, 24 inches, and even a strong man cannot pull on the string with a force of more than about 350 newtons, 80 pounds. It follows that the available muscular energy must be around 0 to 6 meter times 350 newtons, or about 210 joules. This is the most that is available, and we want to store as much of it as possible as strain energy in the bow. If we suppose that the bow is initially virtually unstressed and that the string is almost slack to begin with, then the archer starts to draw his arrow with a pull which is initially nearly zero. And he only works up to his greatest pull when the string reaches its maximum extension. This is expressed diagrammatically in figure two. In such a case, the energy put into the bow is the area of the triangle ABC, which cannot be more than half of the available energy, i.e. 105 joules. In practice the measured energy which was stored in an English longbow was a little less than this figure. However, Homer specifically says that the bow of Odysseus was bale and tonas, that is, bent or stretched backwards. In other words the bow was initially bent in the opposite or wrong direction, so that considerable force had to be applied to it before it could be strung. Figure 2 Energy stored in bow equals one half times zero six times three hundred and fifty equals one hundred and five joules asterisk. When we bow is strung in this way, the archer is no longer starting to draw the bow from an initial condition of zero stress and strain, and by intelligent design, it is now possible to arrange for the figure three Greek stringing bow base painting figure four. Why a bow is stretched backwards or pale in tonas. Energy stored in bow is now area ABCD 170 joules. The area ABCD under such a diagram is now a very much higher fraction of the total available energy and might perhaps reach about 80 per center of it. So it is possible that about 170 joules of energy can now be stored in the bow, 
as against only about 105 jowls for the bow that is not pale and tonos. This is clearly a great improvement for the archer, quite apart from any advantage it might have had for Penelope. In fact all bows are more or less pre-stressed, in the sense that some kind of effort is needed to string them. However, since the longbow is a self-bow that is to say, it is made from a stave which composite bow can be made shorter and lighter than a wooden one. This is why we talk of a wooden bow as a long bow. The composite bow could be made small enough to be used on horseback, as was indeed done by the Parthians and the Tartars. The Parthian bow was handy enough for the cavalrymen to be able to shoot backwards, as they retreated, at their Roman pursuers, from this we get the phrase of Parthian shot. Figure 5. Composite bow, unstrung and strung. The greatest period of classical Greece came to an end when Athens fell in 404 BC, and during the 4th century the Greek democratic governments declined and were superseded by dictatorships or tyrannies which may have been more effective militarily, politically, and economically. Both ashore and afloat the technology of warfare was changing, and the new rulers considered that there was a need for more modern and more mechanized weapons. Moreover, as the absolute masters of increasingly prosperous states, the dictators could well afford to pay the bills. Development began in Greek Sicily. Dionysius I was a remarkable man who had risen from being a petty clerk in a government office to become tyrant of Syracuse. During most of his reign, which lasted from 405 to 367 BC, he made his country the leading power in Europe. As a part of his military program he founded what was probably the first government research laboratory for weaponry. And for this establishment he recruited the best mathematicians and the best craftsmen from all over the Greek world. The natural starting point for Dionysius's experts was the traditional composite handbow. If one mounts such a bow upon some kind of stock and arranges to draw the string by means of mechanical gearing or levers, then the bow itself can be made much stiffer and so be enabled to store and deliver several times as much energy. Thus we arrive at the crossbow, whose missile can generally penetrate any practicable thickness of body armor. Asterisk the crossbow has remained in use, with only minor variations, down to the present time. It is said to be in use in Ulster today. However, it is curious that, as a weapon, it never seems to have played any really decisive military role. Furthermore, the crossbow is essentially an infantry or antipersonnel weapon and it never fulfilled the requirement for a weapon which could do worthwhile damage to the hulls of ships or to fixed fortifications. Although the Syracusans enlarged the crossbow type of catapult and put it on a proper mounting, like a gun mounting, there seemed to be certain physical limitations to this line of development. And catapults of the bow type do not seem ever to have been powerful enough to breach the heavy masonry of fortresses. The next step was therefore to abandon the bow type of construction and to store the strain energy in twisted skeins of tendon much like the skeins of rubber cord which are used to drive model aeroplanes. In such a skein all the cords, that is, the whole of the tendon material, are being stretched in tension as the skein is twisted, so that as an energy storage device it is very effective indeed. There are various ways in which skeins of tendon rope can be used in weaponry, but by far the best was the device known to the Greeks as the palantonon and to the Romans as the ballista. In this very lethal piece of artillery there were two vertical tendon springs, each of them twisted by means of a rigid arm or lever, something like a capstan bar, figure 6. The ends of these two arms were joined by a heavy bowstring, and the whole device worked much after the fashion of a bow. Indeed it got its Greek name from the fact that, in their relaxed position, the two arms point forward, like the arms of a composite bow, and the catapult was strung, by means of a powerful winch, in much the same way as a bow. The missile, which was often a stone ball, was propelled down a track which also served to mount the windlass that was needed to operate the weapon, whose draw force might be as high as a hundred tons. Figure 6. A sketch of what original Greek catapults may have looked like. 
The Romans copied the Greek catapults and Vitruvius, who was an artillery officer under Julius Caesar, has left us a handbook on Ballistae which makes interesting reading. These weapons were made in sizes which ranged from one throwing of 5 pounds, 2 kilograms, missile to one throwing of 360 pounds, 150 kilograms, 1. The effective range of all sizes was about a quarter of a mile or 400 meters. The standard Roman siege ballista seems to have been one throwing a 90 pounds 40 kilograms ball. At the final, dramatic, siege of Carthage in 146 BC the Romans filled in part of the shallow lagoon which lies against the city wall and proceeded to breach the defenses with catapults. Archaeologists have recovered no fewer than 6,000 stone balls, weighing 90 pounds each, from the site. Although ship-mounted catapults were used by both Julius Caesar and Claudius to clear the beaches of ancient Britons during their assault landings on this island, the catapult never became a really dangerous ship-to-ship -ship weapon. It seems likely that a ballista big enough to sink a ship with a single shot would have had a rate of shooting too slow for it to have had much chance of hitting a moving vessel. Catapults sometimes threw incendiary missiles, but fires could generally be put out quite easily in simple ships which were full of men. One ingenious admiral won a sea battle in 184 BC by shooting at the enemy brittle pots filled with poisonous snakes, but this lead does not seem to have been followed up. On the whole, catapults were not a success at sea. Nevertheless, the palantonon or ballista was a most effective device for land warfare, although its construction and maintenance were a very sophisticated business indeed, and the Roman artillery officers and N. C.O.S. must have been highly competent people. With the passing of the Roman Empire and of Roman technology such weapons became impracticable and were forgotten asterisk medieval siege warfare was reduced to using the weight catapult or trebuchet. This was a pendulum-like device using the potential energy of a raised weight. Even a large trebuchet was unlikely to involve raising more than, say, a ton, 10,000 newtons, through about 10 feet. Probably only make a nuisance of itself by lobbing big stones over a fortress wall. Any assault upon heavy masonry would have been ineffectual. Figure 7. The trebuchet or medieval weight catapult, a most inefficient contrivance. Regarded as machines for the conversion of energy, the bow and the pale and tone on both work on similar principles, it is not generally realized just how efficient an energy exchange mechanism is involved. In crude machines like the trebuchet, most of the energy which was available when the weapon was discharged went into accelerating the heavy lever or throwing arm of the device and was ultimately lost in the necessary stop or braking system. With the bow or a pale and tone on, when the bowstring is first released, some of the stored strain energy is communicated directly to the missile as kinetic energy. More of the available energy, however, is being used to accelerate the arms of the bow or the catapult, where it is temporarily stored as kinetic energy, much as it is in the trebuchet. In this case, though, as the discharge mechanism proceeds, the moving arms are slowed down, not by a fixed stop, but by the bowstring itself as it straightens and tautens. This further increases the tension in the string, enabling it to push yet harder on the missile and so speed it on its way. Thus, much of the kinetic energy stored in the arms is recovered. Figure 8. Diagram of the mechanism of the pale and tone on or ballista. A. Ready to shoot. All the energy is stored in the tendon springs. B. Early stage of shooting operation. Heavy arms are being accelerated and so pick up much of the energy from the springs. C. Late stage of shooting operation. Heavy arms are being decelerated by increased tension in the string, and so their kinetic energy is transferred to the missile. D. Missile on its way, containing virtually all the energy which was stored in the system. The mathematics of bows and catapults is difficult and, even when one has written down the equations of motion, they cannot be solved analytically. Fortunately, however, another colleague of mine, Dr. Tony Predlove, 
has been sufficiently interested in the problem to put the whole thing on a computer. It transpires that, rather surprisingly, the energy transfer process is in theory virtually 100% efficient. In other words, practically the whole of the strain energy which was stored in the device can be converted into the kinetic energy of the missile. Therefore little energy is wasted or left behind to provide a recoil or to damage the weapon. In this respect, at least, bows and catapults are a great improvement on guns. One consequence of these facts is, I think, fairly well known to most archers, at least in a practical sort of way. This is that one must never, never, never shoot a bow or a catapult without a proper arrow or other appropriate missile. If this is attempted, then there is no safe way of getting rid of the stored strain energy, and, not only may the bow be broken, but the archer will very possibly be hurt as well. A wet sheet and a flowing sea, a wind that follows fast and fills the white and rustling sail and bends the gallant mast. Alan Cunningham, A Wet Sheet and a Flowing Sea When Galileo settled down at Architry in 1633 to work on elasticity, one of the first questions he asked himself was what are the factors which affect the strength of a rope or a rod when it is pulled? Does the strength depend, for instance, upon the length of the rope? Elementary experiments showed that the force or weight which is needed to break a uniform rope by pulling on it steadily is unaffected by how long it is. This result is what we should expect from common sense, but the news has been some time in getting around and one still meets quite a number of people who are convinced that a long piece of string is stronger than a short one. Of course these people are not just being silly, for it all depends on what you mean by stronger. The steady force or pull required to break a long string will indeed be the same as that needed to break a short one, but the long string will stretch further before it breaks and it will therefore require more energy to break it. Even though the force which is applied and the stress which is in the material remain the same. Mm. Put in a slightly different way, a long string will cushion a sudden blow by stretching elastically under the load, so that the transient forces and stresses which result are reduced. In other words, it acts rather like the suspension of a car. Thus, in a situation where the load is jerky, a long string may well be effectively stronger than a short one. This is why the bodies of 18th century carriages were frequently slung from the chassis by means of very long leather straps, which were better able than short ones to resist the jolts imposed by 18th century roads. Again, anchor cables and tow ropes generally break, not from a steady load, but from sudden jerks, and so it is generally better to arrange for them to be as long as possible. Those who are liable to encounter large dry docks or oil rigs under tow at sea at night or in thick weather do well to bear in mind that each of the tugs is probably towing by means of nearly a mile of steel wire. These nautical processions therefore cover an enormous area of sea and can be terrifying to the casual seafarer asterisk. This quality of being able to store strain energy and deflect elastically under a load without breaking is called resilience and it is a very valuable characteristic in a structure. Resilience may be defined as the amount of strain energy which can be stored in a structure without causing permanent damage to it. Of course, in order to get resilience, it is not necessary to use a very long rope, such as a wire cable. It is often convenient to use much shorter members, such as the helical springs which are used in the buffers of railway trains, or pads of soft material such as are used for ship's fenders, or materials of low Young's modulus. Like the foamed rubbers or plastics which are often used for packaging delicate apparatus. Such things are frequently able to stretch or contract much more in. So make it more difficult to break a structure by means of a blow, it is only too easy to make a structure which is too floppy for its purpose. This usually limits the amount of resilience which can be designed into a structure. Things like aeroplanes and buildings and tools and weapons have to be pretty rigid in order to do their job. In this respect most structures have to be a compromise between stiffness and strength and resilience, and the achievement of the best compromise is likely to tax the skill of a designer severely. The optimum condition may vary, 
not only between different types and classes of structures, but also between different parts of the same structure. In this respect nature is at an advantage since she has at her disposal an enormous range of elastic properties in the different biological tissues. A simple but interesting example occurs in an ordinary spider's web. The web is subject to impact loads arising from flies blundering into it, and the energy of these blows must be absorbed by the resilience of the threads. It turns out that the long radial threads, which form the main load carrying part of the structure, are three times as stiff as the shorter circumferential threads which have the duty of actually catching the flies. Naturally, there are many other ways of storing strain energy and getting resilience than by using tension members, such as ropes or spiders threads, or compression members, such as railway buffers and ship's fenders. Any shape of structure which is capable of being deflected elastically will have much the same effect. Probably the commonest arrangement is to absorb energy by bending, 